I'm Jesse Gray. The program is books. We have a very special guest tonight. You'll recognize him from NBC. He's the author of the best-selling, Strictly Speaking, Edwin Newman. Thank Good you evening. for coming. Not at all. You begin, Strictly Speaking, by asking, will America be the death of English? And you say the outlook is dire. Yes, I think it is dire. <laughs> what is America doing to the English language? I took a little uh, literary license, I think, with that question, will America be the death of English? I don't think English will die. I don't think any language will die as long as it goes on being used. I mean, English will go on being used. What, what we are doing to English, I believe, is draining it of color, draining it of vitality. We're making it a pompous, banal language because of the way in which we use it. And we are depriving ourselves of a good deal of fun by doing that. And we're also inviting the exploitation of ourselves because if you do not insist on high standards of English, if you don't examine what you're told, you're much more likely to be fooled. And I think that this has been true for, this can be demonstrated by events in the last 10 to 15 years. What specifically and who is exploiting? Well, uh, let's, let's remember the language that was used uh, in the course of the war in Vietnam and the misrepresentation that went on through uh, use of phrases like, uh, or terms like interdiction, uh, so that you're not talking about bombing, you're talking about interdiction. Now, when you talk about interdiction, you don't create the impression that people are dying and that blood is being shed and that planes are being shot down and people on the ground are being killed. It sounds like something clean. It doesn't sound like anything that has to do with war. Well, that's a very good example of how a word can be used to conceal, conceal what is going on. In intentionally, do you believe? Oh, I think uh, it was partly intentional. I think some of it comes about unintentionally because of the seductive nature of jargon. Jargon appeals to so many people that they want to use it whether, whether they have anything uh, evil in mind or not. And they do use it. You see this everywhere in the field of education, for example. Uh, it's, uh, it's an expression of self-importance. Uh, let's take the word funding. Funding is a very popular word now. What does funding mean? I saw a report from the New York City Board of Education, because people send me material now. I, I'm <laughs> sure they do, after I, reading your book, I, I have which is a fund of examples, and have, people uh, would only want to elaborate. Self-elected self spies, I suppose I could say, self-appointed spies. And I, I saw a report in the New York City Board of Education on a particular summer program, and one of the recommendations was that, the, that there should be, as I recall, increased support from its own direct funding source, which is to say that it ought to have more money. Now, uh, when you get into, into the field of government and into the field of the social sciences, people don't talk about money. It's undignified. They say funding, which makes it sound somehow, to them at any rate, more impressive, more important, and more difficult to grasp, as though there's some special knowledge were needed to understand it. And that, that is one reason that a lot of these words are used. Well, you say self-importance. You break it down, your book down, too, into politics, journalism, TV reporting, and you give many, many humorous yes. examples in sports, and well, uh, well, you the, specifically go after the social uh, sciences. Uh, well, uh, the, <laughs> let, let, may I give you an example? Yes. It's a very long example, and I won't, I won't read, won't read this, but this was sent to me by a, a civil servant, I guess he is, in, in Boston, who had received a, a letter from another civil servant in Kansas City, Kansas. They're both in the environmental field. And the man in Kansas, who was only beginning his activity, wanted to know whether the man in Boston could help him with advice and examples of what he had done. But he couldn't say that, can you give me any advice and help? This is what he said. Recently, this department became aware of the crucial need to collect sufficient technical information and thereby to implement the methodology of environmental analysis and urban planning. Toward this formidable endeavor, we have researched available information on those organizations displaying excellence in this venue. We therefore wish to present a respectful request for representative examples of environmental and developmental analysis which you have available. And shall I go on? Because it continues this way. Our progress to this point in utilizing fundamental environmental requisites is represented by the creation of a manual but soon to be computerized environmental database. 
Further, we are incorporating existing staff expertise and planning process derived from conventional physical and computer planning capabilities. But without some superior paradigms which depict attainments made on the cutting edge of technical innovation, we will experience an obvious delay in the tool-up phase prior to the urgently needed application. And there's more. Now, this is not a joke. This is somebody... This is an actual letter uh, sent yes, to you. Not, not to me. Sent, sent to a man in Boston who sent me a copy right. of it. Uh, you can see uh, self-importance gone mad in a letter of this kind and the attempt to suggest that there is something here that's very hard to grasp, something abstruse, something that requires special training. And all that he had to say in that letter was, can you give me any help and advice? Now, do, do the people within their own fields understand their own jargon? People within their own fields understand their own jargon, and they use it, it has been said, as a kind of bird call. And as to say, if you use a certain kind of jargon, other people in the field will recognize that you are in the field and will know what you are doing. And those who are not in the field will not understand what you are doing, and so you will hope will be impressed by it. So it is mainly to impress people. Oh, I think so. It? I think so. But it is rampant in the field of education. Uh, I was sent a letter. To, uh, sent a letter by um, somebody who had somehow got it. A letter written by the coordinator of research of the Department of Education in an eastern state. And the coordinator of research of that Department of Education was thanking somebody for having sent him some material. And the material he called summarizative descriptions of law and citizenship programs. Now, you and I would call a summarizative description a summary and be quite happy to do so. But if you call something a summary, people are going to understand what you're talking about and they will realize that there is no magic in what you're doing. If you say summarizative, summarizative descriptions, I can hardly get it out. It seems, it seems to those who use that sort of phrase that it gives them importance, prestige, standing, expertness that they would not otherwise have. Incidentally, that's a good example. Expertise. How many people love to say expertise? All they mean is expertness or knowledge. Have, have you researched jargon? When did this arise, or has it been with us always, perhaps uh, in the church? Old, in I, the j jar jargon is as old as the hills, but I think to use, to use another phrase, a term that's very popular now, there has been a jargon explosion. Uh, and one reason there has been this enormous expansion of jargon is that the social sciences have come to have a position they never had before. Uh, this is partly because so many more people are getting college and university educations. Uh, and becoming it, it has, it has semi-experts uh, in yes, jargon yes, themselves. And, and, it, and, it ha and, <laughs> and the uh, preservation, maintenance of these jobs and these fields, or as they call them, disciplines, has become an industry in itself. So a great deal of what is done in this way is done simply to perpetuate what exists, to protect it. But do you think that what is happening by over-exaggerating and obscuring through words is everything beginning to lose its meaning. I think that happens, yes, and I, I think one can easily find examples of it. Let's take the w word that has become tremendously popular, major. Now, you can pick up the New York Times, for example, and you can see in a single article eight or nine different things referred to as major. Now, if everything is major, nothing is minor. And if nothing is minor, then by definition, nothing is major. Now, what we are in the process of doing is destroying the word major. Uh, we destroy many words in that, uh, in that way. We, we, Usually, we use superlatives to such a degree that uh, they yes, this is, uh, mean nothing. This is, to some extent, I think, the outcome, or a consequence, I should say, of advertising language. Advertising language has a certain desperation about yes. it. <laughs> and, uh, but it, it, it isn't necessary for Which everybody else. Which calls for uh, superlative. Uh, it isn't necessary for everybody else to do it. Now, I often talk about the New York Times because the New York Times has a position that no other newspaper in the country has. But the Times is falling into this so, so that it, it's no longer satisfied to say that a bill has been passed. It will now say a bill has been successfully passed. You find, you say the Times is falling into this. Have oh, you yeah. noticed it literally falling headlong? Uh, I mean, uh, increasingly Increasingly, using. yes, increasingly. And uh, the, the use of the term major is an example. 
Well, the misuse of English, I mean, usages that are flatly wrong, like comprised of and convinced to and concur with rather than concur in, these things are simply wrong. But what we're seeing much more is this, well, it's, it's redundancy, so that you don't say a paper is blank, you say it is entirely blank. And you're not satisfied with a ban, it has to be a total ban. And, and this, <laughs> Complete <coughs> this, redundancy. Yes, yep. and this sort of nonsense uh, gets in, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of it is unexamined. So that the other day, the columnist in the New York Times, C. L. Salzberger, who was in Chile, said that the currency in Chile had fallen had fallen in value by a thousand percent. Now that's impossible. You, the value of a currency cannot fall more than a hundred percent. And uh, that is, but, that's used frequently, yes, uh, yes. the percentage. Yes, or, or people will say that something is ten times as small as something else, but what they mean to say is that it is one-tenth as large as something else. But that's how you come to say foolish things, such as that uh, currency has lost a thousand percent in value. Well, now, you, you uh, talk of exaggeration, too, humorous, humorously. You describe specifically uh, political conventions. Oh, well. There's a special <laughs> word they're very fond they're of. They're very fond of the word great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I suggested that we could save perhaps a day at, every, at each political party convention, save a day at each one every four years by just understanding that the word great occurs before every reference, uh, every reference to a state, every reference to a city, every reference to uh, the party, every reference to the country, every reference to the uh, city where the conventions taking place, every reference to the convention hall, and so on and so on. If we could simply assume the word great before each of those, we'd save hours and hours and hours. And you mentioned that Ford wasn't satisfied with one great. He called Montana, indeed, this one of our great, great yes. Western <laughs> states. <laughs> well, then you mentioned, too, which is, is perfectly true, uh, Campobello Island was given to the United States and Canada. When it was uh, dedicated, was that, is that the word? Johnson, Pearson signed with one pen. Yes. Johnson had yes. at least 140 pens visible. Yes, I, I, th this is a somewhat different matter, but I, I think that there is this, um, I was writing there to some extent about the press and our at the attitudes that we. It's exaggeration uh, again yes, to, it's to exaggeration the point where it becomes again. meaningless. It seems so it? to me. I mean, what, are you, what are you going to do with a pen? The, this is one of the pens that has signed such and such a bill or such and such a resolution. And you're expected to frame it and put it on the wall as though it had some quality of magic about it. I, I remember when I was reviewing plays, I saw a, um, a revival of room service. And there was a brilliant scene in it in which the producer, or the would-be producer of a play on Broadway, had finally got some money. And he was signing the contract. And as he signed the contract, he did it with a succession of pens, as though he were the United States. This was Ron Liebman, a very clever actor. And as he, he would write one letter with a pen, put it down, pick up another pen, write another letter, he hummed, hail to the chief. And I thought that that summed up that. It, uh, it, it does right. perfectly. But you say that this is also dangerous, because you say just as words lose their value, so do ceremonies and events. And perhaps, is this contributing to the uh, skepticism I, of the average American for Yes, I, I, th I think so. But I, the, the point I was making there was that we have uh, gone in for enormous exaggeration about our presidents for a long time. We have exaggerated what they could do. We could exaggerate the amount of good they could do. We have expected them to perform tasks for which they're not suited and to which in the nature of things they cannot be suited. You, you cannot have a president who is the moral leader of the country. You, you can't get that from a practicing politician. You shouldn't expect to. It's nonsense. And uh, I think that because of this exaggeration of the presidency, this aggrandizement of the presidency in, in which the press has played a very large part, we have seen some of the excesses that we have unfortunately become familiar with in the last 15 years or so, Indochina, Watergate, and uh, yes, I think uh, what is sometimes described as apathy on the part of voters is not necessarily apathy, it's skepticism. It's, a, it's, it's a downright cynicism, yes, I believe. Yes, uh, it's a feeling that uh, uh, 
nobody who's running is going to make any difference and that this has been demonstrated. And that all the words mean nothing. Well, the, exactly. I, I think that uh, there is probably much more, I'll put this, awareness of the part that words play. There's, there is this awareness now, I think, to a greater extent than perhaps ever before in the United States. I think Watergate had, had a lot to do with it. I think Vietnam had a lot to do with it. I think the environmental movements had a great deal to do with it. I think uh, people have, many people have seen how words can be used to deceive them. And they understand that if you do not examine words critically, you're not going to examine ideas critically. And it's very dangerous if you don't. But haven't they also found out that words can be led to uh, whatever words are said mean nothing, that they don't uh, signify an action? Well, that's absolutely true, especially in the field of politics. Yes, indeed. So that that also, they no longer believe words. Well, I, I think what is necessary there is to understand that a word in itself is, is neutral. Language is neutral. It can be used for good, it can be used for bad. And eloquence doesn't necessarily uh, imply that the cause is good. The cause in which the eloquence is being implied is a good one. On the other hand, uh, the point I keep making is that if you don't examine, don't examine the words, don't examine the ideas in which the word, uh, don't examine the the ideas that the words clothe, then you're running a grave risk. And I, I think. Uh, to take an example of that, if you think back to John Kennedy's inaugural address when he said we would face any foe and bear any burden, uh, there was a tremendous um, cheer that went up from the press and from many people who said, ah, what an eloquent and inspiring inaugural address. But if you look at it, it seems to me anybody who is sensible would say to himself, well, I don't know that I want to face any foe or bear any burden unless I know what the purpose of doing so is. You have to look at these things. You have to understand what is being said. You have to examine the idea being put forward, and you will not do that unless you, uh, unless you examine the words as well. Well, when you say that people are beginning to examine, you, you mentioned in an interview I read with Leonard Probst that I believe you did some time ago that America, as a result of, of overexposure perhaps, is finally in due or coming around to an attack of common sense? Is this uh, I, I, what you mean I, I, by that? I, I, think we, uh, I think I said we we're perhaps more open to an attack of common sense than we have been in a long time, but I think I was talking there about, about the common sense about the presidency, because oh. uh, not, language and the understanding of the part played by language has a good deal to do with it, but there's another factor, which is that we now have a president who was not elected and a president who I think it's fair to say never could have been elected. And uh, which is not necessarily a reflection on him. Vast numbers of us could never be elected to anything. But what it means is that there hasn't been an enormous public relations operation mounted on his behalf. Uh, lunatic expectations have not been created about him. And we're, we are, in effect, going through an experiment in which we're seeing whether this country can run with a perfectly ordinary man as president or a perfectly ordinary woman, I suppose, someday. Now, that, those are the circumstances in which this country has to run most of the time, because there aren't that many exactly. extraordinary people around. And I think that if we could see the president, in a, if we could have a more casual attitude toward our presidents, if we could understand that leadership has to come and ideas have to come from many sources, not only from the White House, I, I think the country would be in a much healthier position. But I think people are getting cynical, too, because they, they see that leadership and ideas can't even penetrate that level where this jargon smothers all. Well, that, that may well be. Uh, that, I think, is one of, the, that's one of the things I tried to demonstrate in the book, that you have to cut through all this nonsense. And the, and that there is a vast amount of it around. Now, I don't mean to pick on President Ford, but he has one favorite that he loves to use, and that's dialogue. Uh, dialogue is a word that has come into very wide use, and I should say into very wide misuse, because it has long been used. We have different kinds, too, don't we? Ongoing dialogues? Ongoing and, and meaningful dialogues, you know, some constructive dialogues, some deepening dialogues. And, and, uh, 
for example, President, for President Ford, when he was involved in those two shooting incidents in California, said he didn't want to cut down on his public appearances because he wanted to be able to continue his dialogue with the American people. Walking into a crowd, whether it is admirable or not, or desirable or not, to shake hands, it's that's not, not a dialogue. Uh, but the, the point about dialogue that I, I've been trying to make is that it's used as though it has some, some uh, meaning beyond the, the obvious meaning of it, which is a couple of people sitting down to have a talk. People talk about now a, a policy of dialogue. We have a policy of dialogue. We're going in a spirit of dialogue, we will tell you. All they mean is that they're going to talk to somebody. That is, again, as you say in your book, uh, well, you, you say it in reference to journalists, but it would apply to politicians. We like to pump air into our yes, language to make it <laughs> <laughs> to yes. make it gaseous. Well, uh, that's, that I think was demonstrated by the, this letter I, about uh, about the need for some superior paradigms. <laughs> yes, and you give a beautiful example in sociology uh, when one talks of the legitimacy of multiple body styles. Means yeah, that it's, means it's all right to be fat. <laughs> what about the, the art world? Have you looked into that at all, in the art criticism that's produced the art of the last 15 years? I have had uh, some, I've received some suggestions, and uh, flattering suggestions, that I do try to do something about that. I, I have not done it yet. I'm not certain that, I'm, that I understand art sufficiently to do it. But it is that's the jargon mm -hmm. that's yes. got you yes. scared. Maybe so it is certainly true that the, the language is as vague as vague can be. Well, uh, I, I wanted to read you an example. The literalness of the picture surface is not denied. This is a Michael Fried, a critic talking on Frank Stella. But one's experience of that literalness is an experience of the properties of the different pigments of foreign substance applied to the surface of the painting, of the weave of the canvas, above all the color, but not, or not in particular, of the flatness of the support. One could say that here, the literalness of the picture surface is not an aspect of the literalness of the support. Do you agree, Tom Wolfe recently wrote a very interesting book on this subject. He said that modern art has become completely literary, or at least formed by words. The paintings and other works exist only to illustrate the text. I don't know that I would say that. I don't know that I'm qualified to comment on that. I do feel that um, one thing that has happened to contemporary art is that there are almost no standards in it, no identifiable standards, there's all, which means that there's almost no way to judge what you're seeing. If anything goes, then it is very difficult to know what's good and what's bad. Except by the text, as yes, he says. Except by the claims that are put forward for it. Yes. Well, now there are no, there seem to be no identifiable standards in all of American life at the present. There, I think it is what true. What is causing this? I think it is true that we don't have a, we don't have a, a we don't have a systematic criticism in the United States that we need that extends nationally. It's very difficult to do in a country of this size and diversity, and maybe we never will have. But uh, we, we do need, I think, a much more, how to put it, a, a much more criticism, a much more competitive uh, attitude, so that if, by which I mean if you say something, you stand or fall by what you say. If you say something wrong, there's a penalty that goes with it. Now, this is, this is true in, in many fields. It's true in American politics, in which you can be a terrible failure and not be penalized for it. In many other countries, particularly where, where the parliamentary system exists, if you fail, you're out, or you may be out. You may, you may be obliged to resign. You may be dismissed. But in this country, you can go from failure to failure and never lose, <laughs> never lose your eminent position. And because again, you're cloaked by yes, your compatriots. Yes, and, and largely in. And because those of us in the press very often aren't, incidentally, I don't say media, <laughs> which is another example of one of these vague words. Um, those of us in the news business, I say, not cutting through a lot of the hooey that that seems to be endemic in American life. Well, you criticize journalists as much as as uh, any other group in yes. using. I would use one of the words that you say not to use, verbalese. Well, yes, I, I do criticize journalists. I criticize myself. I, I think I'm, I've certainly been guilty of it. And uh, I have 
pushed along ideas that had no substance in them. We often do this for purposes of journalistic shorthand. For example, you, you talk about Lyndon Johnson's Great Society, which pushes along the idea that there is such a thing, that there's some reality in it. And when in truth, it's... Yes, it's again, a slogan. It's words. It's a slogan. You know, we have one minute left. I want to ask you something slightly unrelated to your book. You've seen humanity in so many different ways, in fact, in more facets than most people will. Have you developed a philosophy of life no. in one brief sentence? <laughs> no, I, I have what, not. What everything I, I think if I, if, if I have a philosophy of life, it is, uh, is, is that it's pointless to have one. At any rate, it's pointless for me to have one. And if I have time for one more sentence, I think generally it's pointless for people in the news business to have one. Because for us, the world is just made up of news stories. I didn't mean for the general public. Is it? Well, I'm speaking for myself. Uh, to me, what happens in the world is just, it's a news story, it's a news story, it's a news story, or it isn't. And uh, some people think perhaps that's callous, but I don't know. I think it's perhaps unavoidable in, in the job I'm in. I think it's honest. Thank you very much for coming tonight. We've been talking to Edwin Newman. His book is Strictly Speaking. It's been on the bestseller list for many months, in hardcover by Bob Smerrill and in paperback by Warner. Thank you again for coming. Thank you.